Good to see you. Got some guests here. This is this gentleman right here. Oh, hello, <laughs> hello. How are you tonight? He wants to hear about spies. Okay, we'll tell step him right about over, step spies. right over here. All yeah. right. This, this Hi there. Kyle. Hey guys. He wants to hear about spies. Good. The taller one in the back. A couple of you might know him. That's Chris. <laughs> Who, uh, I know some of you uh, you see WX10 there so we're gonna mute out for a while here and be ready to talk to Tom watch Tom's piece okay Bruce welcome that's great not bad no mm. very good and Fred, welcome from Lake Hopatcong, New Jersey. Are you going to go down to the ham fest tomorrow, Fred? Saturday. Right, Saturday, yep. I'll be there. You're going to be there. Okay. It's a long trip for me. It's seven hours. I don't think I can get there. That's understandable. Are you guys are having one up there somewhere, right? Well, not yet, not yet. You're the first, I think you're the first ham fest in the whole country. And I'm gonna look forward to hearing how it comes out. For those of you who don't know, the New, G New Jersey Antique Radio Club is holding a ham fest tomorrow at the wonderful big uh, uh, museum that they have there. And it's a great site for a ham fest. I hope it's great, Fred. I think the weather is gonna be good. Yeah, that's actually Saturday, Saturday from 8 to 12. That's right. I keep forgetting. Tomorrow's Friday. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I need more one more day to get my stuff together. So. Yeah, you lucky, lucky guy. I, I got a whole barn full of stuff I want to get together, but uh, no place to take it. <laughs> wow. I just want to let you know, this is my sweetheart, KC2LTM. Okay. Hi, sweetheart. Welcome. <laughs> her, name is, her name is Judith, and I'm W2ABE. Very good. Thanks for joining us from Lake Hopatcong, Fred. I'm, I'm on the net with you guys, um, you know, on the, you know, whenever possible. Yeah. Got a good, good signal on the ham bands. Yeah, Friday morning, tomorrow morning at 9.30, correct? Yeah, it's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So Larry, anyone else? I will. I will not be on the net tomorrow. Oh. I can't hear them. Yeah. I'm you muted. Go. Hi, Joe. Good morning. Oh, good evening, everybody. Hey, Joe. Good evening. Hi. Hey, Arnold. Can you join us on that net sometimes? Uh, at nine thirty on Friday morning on thirty-eight zero five. You're muted, Arnold. Oh, I was uh, I was muted. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I finally put up a doublet so I can get on 80 meters. So. Great. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Good. We'll look forward to having you join us. It's a nice group, and uh, we talk about catching groundhogs and chipmunks. <laughs> Okay, oh, we have 22 people here so far. 22 people. They're We're packing rocking. joint here, Tom. They're packing. Looking good. <laughs> hey, Paula, you have, you have good audio, and uh, I see you uh, video-wise. Well, you know, John, uh, how is my audio? Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Very, very good. Well, I tell you what, uh, my older headset, as I told John, I'm navigating away from my HP. My older headset and mic that worked so well with the HP seems to not be too compatible with what I have. However, I did happen to have this little Jabra headset from work at home, and I think I'm going to have to pick one of these up. It, it works much better off the USB than it does on the, the earphone set. You know, it has a setting for the, you know, I think the integrated mic and headphone, when you plug it into that single jack, like the little RCA jack, doesn't work too hot, but... Uh. My old technology has got to catch up with my new technology. I think it's the long and the short of it. Well, you know, it's, it's you've made a major step. 
Right. Oh, well, you know, yeah. So the steps only get bigger the older you get, you know. So. <laughs> there's a, there's a, lot, the of, a lot of trial and error in this stuff. You got to figure out which mics sound good and which cameras look good. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. it's a learning Honestly, curve. I, I have to say, you know, I've, I haven't had the time to invest in investigating this thing as much as I would like, but um, it has a, a B&O speaker in the device itself. So my sound has gone up. I mean, the, the quality of the sound is great. Yeah. It's got a lot of other nifty little features, but it's just leaving that Microsoft world, you know, so. Oh, right. But, yeah, you're, uh, in, you're in Google world. I'm in Chromeville. Yeah, it's a little scary, but... Uh, you know, it's got a lot of neat features. The other nice thing is, too, the, the HP, while it had a, a camera, you know, we used for Zoom, but this actually, the camera is integrated. I can take photographs with it, too. So, I mean, it's got a lot more flexibility, and uh, you know, it's just pretty remarkable how much they cram into these things for not a lot of bucks. But we'll see if I can figure it out. That's the, that's the test. Right. <laughs> so we're, uh, I guess we're about five past. So I, I think we've, we seem to have settled out in people joining. Um, now, I'm sure there'll be a few stragglers, but, you know, maybe in the next minute or two, maybe we, uh, Paul, you can kick it off. Yeah, well, sounds okay. like a good idea. Well, we'll give our little intro here. So uh, welcome all to the Nevik Summer Spectacular of Zoom. You know, this is, uh, we've had a great summer so far with Zooms, and it just continues. So this is the 23rd of July, 2020, and we are graced with Mr. Tom Pereira, who will give us a discussion on the world of spy radio. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to turn that over to Tom and let him do his thing. And thanks for all for coming in. And, you know, it's nice that we have a, a good full house tonight, but I continue to tell you, uh, you know, we try to spread the word on the IO group and all. If, if you have a friend or you know somebody else in the club who hasn't been Zooming, I mean, Tell them to come on down because uh, they're missing great presentations like this one. So, Tom, uh, all yours. Okay, very good. And uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to uh, share a screen and get this thing underway here. Uh, let's see what we can do. Yep, uh, get rid of this. Uh, have to do a few little adjustments here. Uh, and we want to record, and I got to figure out how to do that. Uh, uh, hold on a moment. Uh, is it? No, no, more, okay, more. Record on this computer. Okay, here we go. So, my name is Tom Pereira, and I'm a retired professor of neuroscience, and I specialized in research on the coding strategies of the human brain sort of figuring out how the brain codes and decodes messages. And for almost 40 years, my enigmamuseum.com has been the only organization in the world that hunts for, researches, restores, and provides fully restored and working Enigma cipher machines to museums, historians, and to collectors. Uh, Enigma Museum found and restored the Enigma that appears in the imitation game and the one that appears in Snowden. I've also been very interested in spy radio communications. I was able to buy a lot of spy radios at the end of World War II and play with them, put them on the handbands, and uh, that sparked my interest. So I'm gonna tell you tonight about spy radio communications and a little about the Enigma and end up with some uh, stories about CIA bugs. So here we go. Uh, whenever a country is occupied, uh, troops come into that country and take it over. And it's a very scary, very, very scary thing for the people in the country. And among the things that the troops typically do is they go up into people's houses and up into people's apartments and take over their living quarters. And they throw all their furniture out on the street. You can see a typical dump of furniture out here, which is being trucked away. So the people in an occupied country are not very happy, and they fall into three categories. The citizens fall into three categories. One category says, oh, wow, these guys really are powerful. I better collaborate with them. I'm going to tell them whatever I know about what's going on in my country. I'm going to spy for them, and they become the collaborators. And uh, the second group of interest is the do-nothings. 
and the do-nothings do nothing, as you could well expect, and there are a lot of do-nothings. The third group is what interests us, and that is the people who form the resistance, and these are the patriots. These are the people who fight against the occupying troops, and they get involved in active fighting and spying on the enemy activities in their country, but they also activate radio networks, and they receive news from the uh, opposition, the people who are trying to, to get rid of the people who occupy their country, and they also send out intelligence. The problem is that the resistance are typically not trained radio operators. So uh, the trained radio operators are trained in typically, in this case, Britain, and uh, they become uh, very active and uh, uh, proficient operators, and they're dropped by parachute into the occupied country. And then they set up these portable radio stations, which we call spy radio stations, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So let's get started. We start out with uh, uh, a typical group of par uh, partisans, resistance fighters. Here they are learning about guns. Look at the expression on this guy's face. Wow, he's saying, and uh, looking at this <laughs> machine gun. Am I actually going to get to fire that machine gun? And sure enough, uh, there he is up there with a machine gun uh, shooting at the enemy. So that's known as active fighting against the enemy. The resistance also place bombs on the railroad tracks and any place where they thought it would do a lot of damage to the enemy, and they were very active with that. The major job of the resistance was spying, and spying involved very often taking photographs of enemy installations and enemy activities. You can see in this illustration a camera that is embedded within this woman's pocketbook. And it looks like she's looking into the pocket, but it's, uh, it's actually a Roloflex. And so she's looking right down into the camera viewfinder and aiming it at the thing she's taking a picture of. Here's another kind of spy camera built into a cigarette lighter. And the spy looks like he's lighting a cigarette, but he's actually taking a picture of an en enemy military installation or activity. Uh, some spies do very strange <laughs> things. Uh, this guy is very annoyed by the fact that the clothing rationing had been instituted. And so he decided he would protest clothing rationing by going without clothing. So this is one of the activities of the resistance. Clandestine radio receivers are the bread and butter of the resistance. They bring in for information about what's going on and what the um, allies, the uh, opposing forces want done in the occupied country. And they take many forms, but the critical thing about these radios is that they must be absolutely hidden and not found because if you're found with one, you're instantly killed. So here's a typical spy radio receiver in a suitcase. And the uh, resistance developed all kinds of strange places to put radios. Here's one in a telephone book. Here's one in a furniture leg and one in an electric iron. Look at down here, you see the telephone book, the furniture leg radio, and the radio inside the electric iron. See the two tubes in there? Quite a complex activity to do this. Phonographs were a favorite place to put radios. The phonograph on the left and the phonograph showing the internal radio on the right. Phonograph on the left down there, and phonograph showing the internal radio on the right. Here are some others. How about a brownie camera and a thermos bottle? Open up the brownie camera, and you can see the radio tubes. Open up the thermos bottle, you can see the coils and the radio tubes. And here we have a rather strange uh, clandestine radio. It's actually built into a dental appliance. You put this thing in your mouth and you can actually hear radio stations with it. There's a very strange physiological phenomenon whereby if you put audio signals into your mouth and the uh, signals uh, activate your saliva, it actually transfers into your auditory system. And it's, it's a very, very odd system 
but it actually works. I've tried it. You can take the speaker leads of a radio and put them in your mouth and you can hear what would be coming out of the speaker. I don't advise you try that because some speakers are active with high voltages on them. So don't get any smart ideas about trying that little trick. <laughs> um, here is here is a really peculiar radio. This is a little bit later in the spy radio game. The CIA uh, actually made this radio and the radio fits into, uh, inside of a, a fake scrotum. And this allows you to undergo a body search and they won't find the radio. So it's really quite an absolutely amazing device. The most commonly used spy radio receiver was called the Sweetheart Radio Receiver. It has a receiver, tunable receiver, audio a volume control over here, and a battery pack, and a set of earphones. And this was a very popular set. They were made by the tens of thousands but in England and parachuted into the resistance in France and Norway, all over Europe. Here's a sweetheart radio that's been hidden inside a clock. And here is a sweetheart radio being listened to by some of the resistance fighters. Um, the Germans also provided radios to their own people. And these radios allowed their people to listen to, to hear the Führer, Hort den Führer. And uh, they were allowed to use these radios. Matter of fact, they were made available to them very cheap. They were called the Volksempfänger, like a Volkswagen, which is a people's car, a Volksempfänger. The word Empfänger means receiver, a people's radio receiver. And families were shown listening happily to the, the Fuhrer's voice and uh, the German music during the war. But every radio came with this little warning tag, which basically said, uh, this radio is for listening to the Fuhrer and for German music, if you listen to anything else, you're going to be dead. And uh, they made this a very serious threat by occasionally transmitting tones on the BBC broadcast. And if a person was listening to the BBC broadcast and tones came out of the receiver, uh, neighbors would sometimes hear this and turn them in. And uh, so people were very afraid to listen to the BBC and other broadcasts. Um, clandestine spy radio operators that were parachuted in from England were also called pianists. Uh, sort of think of a pianist operating a piano key and think of a radio operator operating a telegraph key. Again, the penalty is death and many, 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 70% of the people who did this died during the war. Here's a training session for some radio operators where they learn the Morse code, they learn how to operate these clandestine radio sets. They also in England had extensive wardrobes of German officers' uniforms and all kinds of uniforms so they could parachute their spies into Germany and outfit them so they would fit into whatever uh, area of Germany they were aimed for. Uh, the radio sets were packed very, very carefully. This is a B-2 spy radio, but it's been packed in this incredibly uh, flexible and soft packing, which is designed to allow it to survive uh, being dropped from a parachute from an airplane. Here are the radio operators climbing into the airplane, getting ready to be para-dropped into the um, French countryside. And here they are after they've made it to the French countryside operating their spy radio. And the operators, the radio operators, uh, look very normal. They always had to have an antenna. You can see the antenna wire going up here. And the favorite place to put an antenna was up the chimney of whatever house they were in because you couldn't see it from outside. So they'd run an antenna up the chimney and transmit for a while and then quickly take the antenna down. Here's another operator with two spy radios. Here's a very deadly looking uh, radio <laughs> operator with a spy radio. It looks somewhat familiar, but uh, really some guy you don't want to meet in a dark alley. And here is a very, very famous and wonderful spy uh, radio operator, code, code named Paulette. Uh, 
and she was parachuted into Normandy before the invasion at age 23, and here she is over here at age 23, and here's how she looks nowadays. She sent half-hour coded reports and then ran far away from her radio set, knowing that she would be found by direction-finding teams within one and a half hours, so she really had to skedaddle out of there. Um, her activities were very important for the <coughs> reporting of what was going on in these occupied countries. Here she is sending. She also, every night, would hide her radio in various places. Uh, one part of the radio, the receiver part, fit right into a vacuum cleaner, so unlikely that she would be caught with that. <coughs> Here's another female radio operator sending Morse code with a telegraph key, a spy radio over here. And if there were no mains powers, no AC power, the power was often generated by a hand-operated generator, such as you see in the background. <coughs> Messages were gotten to these spy radio operators in loaves of, of uh, spoiled bread, so the Germans would not be tempted to look inside the bread. Uh, here is a lady carrying a spy radio. They're very, very heavy, as we'll, we'll see why in a moment. <coughs> and she is carrying it up a flight of stairs, trying to look innocent. It's a lot easier if you happen to have a bicycle. There's the spy radio on the back of the bicycle. Much easier to transport it that way. And here are a couple of spies in the woods uh, transmitting messages. Notice that this guy has a machine gun. This guy has a machine gun. This guy has a machine gun nearby. And here's another group with machine guns handy over here. And they are using a hand crank generator to make the electricity for their spy radio. Clandestine spy radio sets came in a number of different types, but by far the most frequently seen was the <clears throat> British design <coughs> and made B2 radio. These sets are outlined and described in a wonderful and very expensive book uh, on clandestine radio written by Louis Mulesty, uh, who is, by the way, a ham. It's the Bible of those of us who collect spy radios. Here's one version of the spy radio type A, mm -hmm. British made in Britain and uh, very popular among spies and looks very innocent in its suitcase. Here's a parachutable version of it in a metal case so to withstand the drop of, from a parachute and uh, it is known as a paraset. And here is the classic British B-2 spy radio. It was designed initially by John Brown, G-3, E-U-R. And we have here a receiver in the front, a transmitter in the back, and plug-in coils and plug-in crystals for those. And over here on the right is a multiple voltage power supply. And in back here, you find a telegraph key. Here's the schematic diagram of the uh, transmitter. Very simple crystal oscillator over here, power amplifier over here, and out we go to the uh, plug-in coils and out to the antenna. The receiver is tuned RF stage receiver, uh, high gain amplifier feeding the information out to the other stages of the radio. And this is the power supply. This is very interesting because the power supply worked on six, 12, 24, uh, volts DC and 110 and 220 volts AC. So it was a very neat uh, power supply. Problem was this doggone transformer, multi-coil, multi-turn transformer was exceptionally heavy and that made the entire set very heavy and you couldn't walk around very easily with this thing unless you were pretty small, strong because it would pull you over and uh, literally pull you over to the side. And here you are trying to <coughs> make it look as though you just have a suitcase full of clothing, but the, the thing's pulling you down. So it looks a little bit suspicious. A um, little bit of uh, nomenclature for you. Mike Cresto, Mr. Mike, W1RC, gave a talk with me on spy radios and he made this little chart for World War II Radios that start with an SCR followed by a number are known as set complete radio, and that's transmit, receive, and power supply. BC is basic component. In late World War II, the PRC models came in, and that stands for portable radio communications. In the 1950s, we had 
TRC, tactical radio communication, GRC, ground radio communication, VRC, vehicle radio communication, sync car, single channel, ground and airborne radio system. And it got more complicated after that, but it's useful to have these abbreviations in mind. Here, for instance, is a PRC-1, very early suitcase uh, portable radio. And here is a GRC, round uh, radio uh, in a suitcase, uh, the telegraph key over here, separate receiver and transmitter and power supply. And then you get into the really, really odd experimental radios. This is an experimental scuba radio. You wear the radio on your back along with your air tanks. You talk into your mask. I don't know what you do about an antenna, but I never flew, so I've never never seen more than one of these. And here is another one. This is a doggy radio. Um, it's not clear from any of the literature whether this allowed the uh, trainer here to talk to the dog and give the dog directions by way of an earphone that you see strapped on the dog here, or whether the dog could talk to the trainer. No, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> whether the dog could be given directions as to go and, and sniff around or bite somebody. So, But this is a sort of an evolution of the spy uh, radio system. I'm going to give you a little look in a secret theta room. There's a network of spies that hid <laughs> away in the back of one of these buildings in the Bergen Norway seaport. A big seaport, lots of ships in World War II, and a lot of buildings over here that took care of the people in the ships. And if you look at these buildings, they're very long buildings. And this little spy headquarters was in the back. Here's the waterfront down here. And way in the back here, we see the Theta Room. It's named the Theta Room because the code name for this group of spies was the Theta Group. In order to get there, you had to lock down, walk down this incredibly long passageway. You had to find your way up this flight of stairs to the second floor. You had to find your way up this flight of stairs through this camouflaged uh, cover door here to the third floor. And then you had to look around for a door. And there was no obvious door up there. But if you knew exactly what to do, this set of wooden boards became a door. And my wife is shown here holding the only way that you can open this door, which is to have a piece of metal wire and to connect this nail over here on the left to this nail over here on the right. And if you did that, it activated an electric motor. There's the left nail and the right nail contact. Activated an electric motor, which was belt driven to pull the latch on the door and allow you to enter. If you, on the other hand, tried to break down the door, you would be blown up. There was in the same room a large uh, box full of TNT, dynamite, and some batteries. So this was the bomb, which would blow you up if you tried to enter the room. Here's the room, and up in that cabinet is where the bomb is hidden. You can see a number of radio receivers here, a large transmitter with a big rheostat for adjusting the power, and all of the equipment that the well-equipped spy would need. Here we have the B2 radio up on a shelf. Here we have we know what that is, a sweetheart radio hidden in a cutout of a book. Here we have some guns in a drawer along with some money, uh, hand grenades, and of course, very importantly, some surgical instruments in case any of the spies were uh, injured in their activities. The most important part of this room, however, was a dark room where they um, developed and printed the pictures that they took because their main job was to take photographs of the enemy installations and the enemy ships. And here's a picture of an enemy, German enemy ship that was taken by a Theta spy and transmitted to England, actually taken to England for uh, analysis by the English. So that was a very important uh, uh, group. And uh, of course, their major problem was direction finding, people that were looking for them. When they would transmit a signal, little trucks like this one would be rolling around in the street with complex direction finding antennas like the one you see on this truck here, trying to track them down. And it's interesting, the Theta group never got caught by direction finding. They kept their transmission short. They did get caught, however, by a German soldier 
who was inspecting the roof over the Theta room, and he fell through the roof into the Theta room and literally found himself in the middle of the spy headquarters. And although none of the spies were there, it gave away their location, and some of them were caught as a result. Happily, uh, unfortunately, perhaps, he did not blow himself up with a bomb, and, uh, but the room was uh, discovered, and it's now a museum. If you ever get to Bergen, Norway, it's an absolute bust. You've got to go see the Theta Room. Here are some other direction-finding vehicles. Sometimes they were inconspicuous, like this car, which had a hidden direction-finding system inside the car. Less uh, inconspicuous uh, direction-finding truck. Sometimes these trucks had uh, operators inside and the idea is you rotate this antenna and you find the bearing, the magnetic bearing between your truck and the radio of the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the spy radio. And that helps you locate where the spy radio is. They also use the Feisler Storch, a very, very slow flying uh, surveillance aircraft with a direction finding antenna on it to help find the location of these spies. All, both of these techniques, the truck and the aircraft, could only locate spy radio installations within a few blocks within a city. And at that point, you had to get down on your feet and use a device like this suitcase hidden uh, spy radio direction finder. And you can see the direction finding receiver, the direction finding loop, the sense antenna inside the suitcase and you can see that there are thumb controls that allow you to control the, uh, the power and uh, turn off, off the headset or the volume. And you wore a set of inconspicuous headphones when you were doing that. Here is a KGB, no, a, a, a German uh, um, officer uh, outfitted to find hidden radios. And he's actually carrying a hidden body-worn radio receiver. The antenna for this receiver is in his arms. And so when he moves his body, it actually changes the signal strength. And by turning his body so that his arms are pointing in line with this receiver, with, with the, an enemy transmitter, you get a null and he could locate the antenna, the transmitter. Uh, if we undress him, we see that he actually is wearing this thing under his clothes, but it looks really inconspicuous until he opens up and shows us. This is a battery operated tube type receiver with the antenna in the arms. Very, very deadly. And it allowed the Germans to pinpoint a enemy radio transmitter within a very, very narrow range of options. Uh, his readout was a uh, wristwatch had been modified as a signal strength meter so that the stronger the signal that was coming in, the more that red needle that you see there would move over to the right. And so he could look as though he was just quietly looking at his wristwatch uh, while at the same time he was very accurately pinpointing the location of the spy radio operator. Uh, to counter this, uh, some clandestine uh, operators used very, very rapid Morse code sending devices called burst encoders. And uh, you can't send the Morse code very, very fast. The fastest you can send the letter A dot dash is about da da, and that takes a while. But if you take this uh, stylus here and you run it down the slot that says A here, very, very quickly, it makes a short contact and then a long contact, dit da, and sends the A extremely rapidly. So even if you didn't know Morse code, you could use this device and send these letters so fast that the radio intercept operators were actually unable to detect the, um, the message and unable to locate using the radio direction finding antennas. Uh, so that was one of the techniques that the spies used. They also used enciphered messages. And here we see a spy um, writing a message in code. And here it is, uh, actual transcribed message in code, five letter group so they could be transmitted by radio to a receiving station. Or they could also be embedded within a walnut shell and uh, carried over to England. 
uh, in an inconspicuous form like this. Uh, German spy controllers often used Enigma machines to keep the messages to spies secret. The spies never used Enigma machines because they were too heavy and too cumbersome and too uh, likely to be captured. But the controllers used Enigma machines to communicate all over Germany and talk about where their operators were. So they were really giving away the location of all of their spy radio operators by communicating using Enigma machines. And of course, the British were intercepting the Enigma signals and decoding the Enigma messages. And this re revealed the actual location of the spy radio operators. So these radio operators were actually uh, revealed by the Enigma messages. Here is one of them. He uh, parachuted in, into England. Uh, his name was Tate, and he was a double agent. He was given the choice, as all of these guys were. You can have two choices. You can either be hung or you can work for us, the British, and pretend that you haven't been captured, and you can send messages back to your people in Germany uh, at our command. And he chose not to be hung, and uh, he became a double agent, which meant he sent messages back to Germany. He was given a personal code wheel, which he used for encoding his own messages. Again, they didn't have Enigma machines, the spies didn't, but they sent messages back in coded form. Here's another guy. This guy set up a beautiful ham radio station right in the middle of New York City during the war, about 1942. A uh, nice dog over here on the right, some typical uh, ham receivers, a battery down under the shelf here. And uh, here he is transmitting. And he was sending sec secret messages embedded in his inconsequential sounding ham radio conversations. And they got back to England. And he was found out because his controllers talked about him on an, the Enigma and they located him. He was actually hidden in the top floor of this apartment building in New York City. That was his room up there. Here's a picture of him here on the left. Uh, and uh, he was a very active spy until he was caught. Um, at the end of the war, uh, the radios that had been confiscated from everybody, nobody was allowed to have a radio, as we've said, uh, were finally given back. And you can see some lovely old radios being given back to people here. And that made them all very, very uh, happy. So that's what I have to say about the spy radios. Now we're going to move on and talk a little bit about CIA bugs. Bugs are hidden microphones that allow you to listen in on what's going on inside a room. And this set of uh, information, this talk really, was put together by very dear friends of mine, Paul Rubers and Mark Simons. And they run by far the very best website having to do with spy radios and uh, crypto machines like Enigma machines. And their, their uh, internet site is cryptomuseum.com. We start out with hidden microphones. And one of the most common hidden microphones that was used was a wristwatch with a microphone in it and a wire going to a tape recorder that a person kept in their pocket. So the wire would go up your sleeve to a tape recorder. This is a wired microphone. And here is a wireless microphone. This is a radio transmitter that is actually slipped inside the knot of a necktie. You can see the antenna here is curled around the person's neck. And the problem with this type of transmitting microphones is that they have to have a battery and batteries wear out. So they are limited in their ability to function. Here's a CAT scan of a CIA microphone bug in a pen. And you can see the various components because the CAT scan reveals what is uh, inside the pen. On the left, we have a battery. Here we have a little capsule microphone, typical condenser mic, a transistor, 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 uh, the transmitter in the middle here. And way over on the right, we have the loading coil and a little bit of an antenna stub. And this was good for short range transmissions and would pick up any audio uh, near the pen and transmit it, but again, limited by the fact that the batteries had a fixed life. This is a Russian phone tap, and this device was sneaked into the basement of a person's home, 
Uh, it was designed to look just like a signal conditioning uh, sensor. And it says on it, signal conditioning sensor. And that, of course, is meaningless. Uh, you don't need the signal conditioning, the phone lines. But what it actually was, was a phone tap. And it tapped into the phone line, used a couple of condensers so it wouldn't load down the phone line, used an amplifier chip over here to increase the signal strength. And then it fed out the information to a transmitter uh, or a direct wire to a tape recorder. Now, this was a technique installed in hundreds and hundreds of uh, homes and basements in Russia during the Cold War. Here's a KGB bug, a very simple miniature transmitter of the 1960s, had a single transistor. Uh, you can see the transistor right in there. It was a free running oscillator and the crystal earpiece uh, that you see here actually was a microphone and it, it frequency modulated the signal uh, in a tuned circuit. The uh, problem with this was, first of all, it depended on batteries, and secondly, it was relatively easy to find. All you needed was a bug detector of some kind. Here's a very complex bug that was built into an IBM Selectric typewriter. It was way down in the workings of the typewriter, looking very innocent, but it's a very complex set of electronics using the electrical um, energy from the typewriter to keep the bug going, and any auditory signals in the, na in the vicinity would be rebroadcast uh, by radio to uh, rooms nearby where receivers might be picking up the information. So there were just huge numbers of bugs, and this table just shows some of the many, many kinds of uh, hidden microphones or bugs that were used by these uh, spy um, operators and spy operations. Uh, to detect the bugs, a device called a bug detector was used. And this is one of the simplest of the bug detectors. It has two antennas, a small one and a large one. As you can imagine, the large one for a lower frequency set of signals, the small one for a higher frequency. And over here, you can see the schematic diagram, the high band antenna and the low band antenna. And these both feed into just a simple diode. And the diode then is switched in depending on whether you are looking at high frequency signals or low frequency signals. The diode is switched into an amplifier and the amplifier then amplifies the output and operates a meter on the front to indicate the uh, relative signal strength of uh, what you're listening to or a set of earphones or a loudspeaker. And people could walk around with this device looking fairly innocent. This guy looks pretty innocent, I would say. It doesn't look like he's listening in for bugs. But if he does a, uh, a little revealing act, it, suddenly you see his, uh, his radio on his uh, chest there and his earphone. So um, you can walk around fairly innocently and uh, detect these signals in that way. Or you can use a uh, signal detecting device. This is another receiver used during the Cold War uh, for detecting spy radios. And you can see very obviously here, uh, there's a loop antenna and you just turn your body to look for a null or a peak in the signal strength uh, using this type of device. Um, the uh, next step, of course, there's always this ongoing war of uh, between people uh, and uh, between the spies and the people who are trying to detect them. Uh, one of the techniques that was used was to use jamming. And for jamming, an external radio source would produce a, law, a strong signal that would basically uh, jam the radio transmitting bug in the center of, let's say, a room here. Uh, and since the signal was synchronized, uh, you could uh, null out the signal and you could then detect the signal from the bug if you were operating the jamming transmitter. And of course, the jamming signal would completely obliterate the signal coming from the bug for anybody trying to detect the signal. So what do you do to counteract that? You develop a um, differential receiver. A differential receiver is an interesting concept in which you have two exactly balanced antennas. And if a signal comes into the left antenna 
and the right antenna, antenna simultaneously, uh, that signal is canceled out. Here we see the, the uh, detector down here with the right antenna A2, left antenna A1, and the jamming signal comes in, and if it reaches these two antennas exactly the same moment, that jamming signal is uh, completely blocked out, a uh, typical differential amplifier circuit, and that leaves you able to receive the bug signal. So very neat technology developed to overcome jamming technology. Uh, another technique that was developed, uh, if you're going to have bugs and, and all, why not have a real bug? And so the CIA in the 1970s uh, started building these incredibly complex drones, uh, which were electrically operated. They had a little battery in them. They had radio transmitter, and they had a microphone in the tail over here, and they would buzz these things through the room. So uh, if you can't jam a signal, uh, you, you run these little bugs through a room and pick up sounds, uh, hopefully without anybody noticing and swatting at the bug. Uh, this was not very successful because it did make a little more noise while it was flying than was optimal. So in the 19, 2017, the CIA got the idea of using a real dragonfly bug. And here you can see this poor little dragonfly over here with a complex radio system mounted on its back, little antenna, a microphone, a chip, and so on. And this poor little thing has to fly around the room and uh, listen in to enemy um, discussions. Um, this was fairly successful, surprisingly. It doesn't look like it would work but it was fairly successful. It shows you the ends that people will go to in order to uh, overcome the uh, various techniques that are designed to overcome jamming. Um, the next step we need to talk about is the incredible uh, coup in which the um, Russians gave a beautiful seal of the United States to the Americans when the Americans opened their embassy, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And in 1945, right at the end of the war, the Russians said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping us with World War II. We want to thank you so much. We've had this beautiful seal of the United States made for you. And the Americans put this up in the main room in their embassy. And inside the seal was a little single piece of wire and a very strange looking little round thing. And uh, in 1952, it wasn't until 1952 that the CIA actually found this little thing inside the seal. And they didn't know what it was because it certainly wasn't a hidden microphone or anything like that. And they were so embarrassed by this, I think, that uh, the, uh, the discovery was not publicly revealed until 1960. And uh, this was a very strange device in here. It was a passive element, just a piece of wire, no electronic parts at all, and no batteries. How could it possibly be transmitting a signal to a receiver if there are no electronic parts, no batteries, and so on. So let's take a look at it. Here it is. Here's the actual device that they found. And it is here, you can see, a capacitive microphone. And uh, the uh, membrane of the microphone is here. And the uh, other side of the capacitor is this metal plate here. And the metal plate is capacitively coupled to the antenna over here. So electrically, the schematic looks like this. The variable capacitor that you see here is the capacitive microphone. There's a little fixed capacitor here and a tuning coil over here, and then a series capacitor that allows you to tune the antenna to the appropriate frequency. The, uh, the microphone diaphragm would vibrate back and forth. That would uh, change the electrical characteristics of the so-called tuning post that you see here. And the coupling disc would couple the antenna to the tuning post. So a signal, an auditory signal coming in here would produce capacitive effect on the entire system. But that still doesn't explain how the signal got out of the room. 
And for that, we need to realize that the room was constantly being bombarded by high energy radio frequency signals. The radio frequency signals were causing the passive antenna element that we've seen to vibrate electronically, to oscillate. Uh, let's say you put in 10 megacycles and this little wire is oscillating at 10 megacycles or megahertz. And then the uh, receiver, uh, an associated receiver, was able to detect the 10 megahertz signal from this oscillating wire and receive it. And they were able to cancel out the initial energy supplying RF signal and detect the actual audio. Here you see the microphone and the, um, in this case, uh, with a mechanical amplifier that modulated the wire with audio frequencies. Here's a little closer look at the circuit and the circuit as it later evolved. We have an antenna element, which is just a passive piece of wire and a diode in the middle, sort of a diode with a dipole with a diode in the middle. The diode allowed the uh, exciting, the exciting voltage to produce a voltage that could then be used to operate an audio amplifier. And so here's a microphone with an audio amplifier being operated by the voltage coming off this diode. And the audio amplifier is feeding the audio signal into and um, causing the antenna element to oscillate at audio frequencies. A little finer detail over here, you have uh, chokes to get rid of the RF and a very, very simpler, simple microphone audio circuit down here amplifying the signal. So this technology was absolutely new and surprising and interesting to the uh, KGB uh, who had designed it. They kept designing better and better ones and also very interesting to our um, people who were uh, taking apart the um, Great Seal and trying to figure out what was going on. The CIA finally figured it all out and they started building these devices of their own and they decided that they really wanted to bug the Russian embassy. Since the Russians had bugged their embassy, they wanted to bug the Russian embassy, which is located over here in The Hague in the Netherlands. And so they did that by, first of all, getting to a desk that they knew was going to be installed in the Russian embassy. And they took apart the desk and uh, specifically the leg of one corner of the desk, and they inserted their um, passive element microphone into a hole in the leg of the desk. They weren't stupid, so they actually drilled similar holes in all the other legs of the desk and inserted wires in there. So if the Russians used the metal locator to check it out, it would just look like all of the legs were uh, uh, the same. And if they decided to take apart one leg, chances were that they wouldn't take apart the leg that had the microphone in it. So here is a later evolution of the same technology that we've been talking about. You have to irradiate this thing with high energy RF and detect the signal that it is radiating. Microphone up here on the top and they were able to listen in to any and all conversations that were going on inside the room. Now here is the setup. On the left over here you see the, um, the area where they're going to try and uh, detect the signals and 125 meters away on the right, you see the Russian embassy. Now that's a long distance, and therefore you need a great deal of power in order to do that. And so in the top room of this building here on the left, they set up a 10 kilowatt uh, RF generator. <laughs> that is 500 watt transmitter with an antenna that multiplied the um, power of the transmitter up to 10 kilowatts. So they were blasting the Russian embassy with 10 kilowatts of energy. You may perhaps remember back to uh, a little earlier this year, last year, when some of our <clears throat> diplomats in the Cuban embassy were complaining of headaches and uh, various kinds of strange ailments and neurological problems, it is highly likely that they were actually being bombarded by a transmitter, perhaps even more powerful than this one, which was used back in 1958 
to uh, bug the Russian embassy. Anyway, transmitting from up here, uh, up this flight of stairs, and the antenna was located pointing out this window at the Russian embassy, and they blasted the Russian embassy with a very, very high power signal, and they were able to actually receive the audio from the desk in the Russian embassy. So that's the technology that was being used and is still being used, and it allows people to uh, bug rooms without actually having to have uh, direct connections to uh, any kind of microphone, without having to worry about batteries uh, or anything of that type. So that's my story, and I'm Tom Pereira again, enigmamuseum.com. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, visit our website, enigmamuseum.com, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions after the meeting is over. Let me see, I'm going to uh, stop the recording and stop sharing and ask if anybody has any questions. Hope it all got through to you all. Well, Tom, uh, just thank you uh, for a very educational, informative, enlightening <laughs> presentation. I have to say, I, I, I am feeling a little paranoid right now. I was patting down the cat <laughs> to see if there was any type of electronic device that you may have uh, been trying to slip in, you know, infiltrate in. And I also want to know if you were that guy in the van in front of my house when I was listening to the Moscow mailbag when I was just a little kid. <laughs> sitting up in my room. But, uh, you know, it's a very interesting perspective on, you know, not only the war, but the Cold War. And all I could think of uh, during the uh, presentation section when you were looking uh, at the French resistance is this uh, 41 Rue Madeleine with Jimmy Cagney and the BBC is broadcasting the lamb is ready for the slaughter, which of course was the D-Day signal. But, you know, uh, a little corny, but uh, right on, you know, as far as how that all works. So, Thank you very much. And if folks have questions or comments, uh, John, I guess we can kind of go around the group and uh, see who might have something to add in or have a question for Tom. Sure. No, uh, we can either go down the room or if anyone just wants to raise their hands. Um, yep. The two or just stuff. Click and raise click. your hand or raise it physically. Yeah, excellent and we'll presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Great job. Go ahead, Bruce. Unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to thank you there, Tom. Uh, you you held the attention of a five-year-old and eight-year-old for more than half the show. So I, when, it, when when the video comes out and we put it out there, I'll send it to my son because he wanted to send it to a couple of his friends. So I appreciate. Good. it. I'm going to leave you all for now and go back with the uh, the kids and the grandchildren. So thank That's you. great. Thanks for bringing them, Bruce. Bet. Good to have them join us. Did, well, did Alan the, have Alan Finger have a question? Did I see Alan uh, raise his hand? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, just wanted to thank you. That was a great Alan. Talk. Well, you're certainly welcome. I uh, I love this stuff. When I was a kid, I probably told you I was uh, able to uh, hunt around on Radio Row, and I make, got to buy a lot of the uh, current spy radios of that time. And I'm still fascinated by them. I have the, uh, the typical radio used by the Navajo code talkers here. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorites, a little bit heavy, but uh, <laughs> the classic uh, radio that they used. And I love putting this thing on the air. It sounds absolutely terrible, but it is fun to get it on, crank it up, and uh, put a signal out and tell people that they're they could be talking to a, a Navajo uh, code breaker, a Navajo uh, code talker. And uh, back in those days, all kinds of radios were very readily accessible. You could buy a pair of these BC-611s for $5 with the batteries and uh, really have a lot of fun as a kid, as a young ham radio guy with that kind of thing. So it's kind of stayed with me. Um, even though I'm a lot older now, I still feel just like a kid when I start picking up these things and talking about them. So it's a way of losing about uh, 60 years if you want to give it a try. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm a couple of years behind you and 
um, I was a um, constant visitor to Canal Street surplus stores. That's and great. I was picking up all my parts and, and stuff over there, plus the radios I was dis I was disassembling at home. So, yeah. yeah, wasn't that wasn't that wonderful fun? You remember uh, on Canal Street, you could buy a complete working Norden bomb site for five bucks. And the only reason I, I loved them was that you could take them home and you could just spend hours and hours taking the things apart. You got hundreds of gears and screws and nuts, which you were sure you're going to use sooner or later for something or other. Uh, which, what was your favorite hangout on Canal Street? Oh, gosh, you know, I don't remember the names of the places. They were just, I mean, uh, they were just do you, do you remember how it went? There were just rows and rows. I do remember, but I used to, there was one place that had bins of discarded, of reject transistors. So they never put, you know, in, in those days they were all metal case and they never put the top on them. So they, they made great photo, uh, photo detectors. Oh, nice. Very nice. That's a, that's a great application. Did you ever go down a little set of stairs into a, a, a little shop where the guy had lots and lots of parts on uh, flat tables? Uh, his name was Phil Weingarten. He was the guy who made fake radios. And I don't oh, know whether yeah, you... I remember, I remember that talk. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't remember. I, the place I do remember with the transistors had it was very long and narrow, and it had bins on, on racks on the side, and then it had surplus electronics, you know, old, you know, government receivers and transmitters, and a few, um, um, you know, uh, motor generator sets. He had, he, did he have a lot of, uh, a number of oscilloscopes on his rack sometimes, too? I think so. I yeah. think so, yeah. That might have been the guy. There were about five or six shops over there, so I used to, I used to I used to come in from Queens. Well, I was right in Manhattan, so I didn't even have to. It's not much of a trip. <laughs> oh, the subway was no problem, and then I go over to Chinatown. Yeah, yeah. all right, for a little good food. <laughs> Those were great days, weren't they? Uh, I I miss it. And you go down there now, there's nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Although there there there's the. There are a couple of shops left if you really know where to look. There's one little guy curled around, and uh, um, not much left, though. You're right. I, I did make a movie of uh, Radio Row, Cortland Street, uh, as they were being knocked down by the World Trade Center a little bit before and as it was being um, demolished. And it's uh, interesting to look at that. I'll have to show that here at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if there's any material about, about, um, about, well, Radio Row, there's quite a bit, but Canal Street, I'm not sure. It would be interesting to try to gather, you know, some history of what was there. I, don't, I have no idea how to do that. Yeah, I, I'm just keep hoping that somebody, uh, I was able to find some good uh, videos and pictures by Googling uh, Radio Row and uh, Cortland Street. So uh, you might just try Googling Canal Street surplus stores and see because God, Google is <laughs> just yeah, amazing. There was a fellow who wrote an article that appeared in the old Antique Radio Classified, and I believe we may have reprinted it in The Raven, or some club I belong to had reprinted it. And I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was a New Yorker. And, um, you know, he shared a lot of his memories of Radio Row and put together a, a nice little nice. article with a lot of interesting photos as well. And I'm not sure if he is still with the club down there or not, but, you know, he'd be a nice guy to talk to, you know, if you were trying to remember a specific place or, you know, find out uh, who bought what where. But there is a, a refugee, I believe, Leeds Radio is still in New York, though I'm not sure where. And I think they were somewhere uh, in Radio Row. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I, Leeds was an amazing guy. He was a, a really nasty old guy. He had a horrible <laughs> smelling cigar, but he had four floors of just the most fantastically wonderful surplus stuff. And I used to go in there and just sort of sit at his feet and, and gobble up <gasps> this stuff. And he, he would, if he, if someone came into the store that he didn't like, he'd just say, get out, get out. 
<laughs> without any question at all. And uh, the neat thing was he would get really stinking drunk on Friday night. <laughs> and uh, I knew that. And one Friday night I got down there and I said, Mr. Leeds, how about letting me go upstairs uh, and just look? And he said, all right, kid, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> and that was the, probably the high point of my life at that point. <laughs> it was just three floors of the most beautiful stuff. Many of boxes had never been opened. And Leeds actually was uh, taken over by either his son or a relative, and they moved to Brooklyn, and then they moved it up somewhere in the Bronx, as I recall. Uh, but uh, the, the old store, it's interesting, the old store was there until fairly recently because he Leeds had it had embedded his name in the sidewalk. He'd put little stones with his name, Leeds Radio, right in the sidewalk there, and that yeah. didn't get destroyed with the World Trade Center. That's great. That's a great story. <laughs> Paul? Yes. Yes, yep. sir. Uh, the gentleman who wrote that article you referred to in a Antique Radio uh, Classified was Norm Hertz, mm -hmm. and he's a club member. Yeah, and, and we did reprint it in Raven uh, last year. That's well, right. see, my memory still my memory still works. That's great. I think I also wrote a little <laughs> letter uh, in response to Norm's letter. Uh, I've known Norm for many years, and and I agree that that's neat. And another interesting thing is uh, the, some of the people in the New Jersey Antique Radio Club. Uh, saw my talk on Phil Weingarten, and some of them actually knew him very well and knew his machinist very well. Interesting. And so I got a lot of feedback on that. And they've asked me to give that talk at that club, and I'm going to turn around and get those guys to talk about their experiences as well as doing my normal Weingarten talk. Bill Holly, I see your hand up there. How are you doing tonight? I'm pretty good, Paul. And, and when you asked... Um, uh, Tom, if he was in that van outside your house, it reminded me of something. Uh, when I was in the Coast Guard, I was a radio operator. I held the top secret clearance because of uh, some of the crypto gear we used. But at any rate, when I was at the sea, my wife would often go down and listen in on my general coverage receiver to the uh, short wave bands. And she was a typical short wave listener and sent um, reception reports to the different stations she uh, heard and get letters back from them verifying her, her uh, uh, listening to them. And uh, one day after we were in port, I had the uh, Coast Guard Investigative Service, the uh, uh, Coast Guard's equivalent of NCIS, uh, drop into my office and said, uh, hey, Chief, you got any idea where your wife is getting letters from Russia? <laughs> mm. I had a good idea. And uh, I told them, yeah, she had access to my shortwave equipment at home and was playing shortwave listener and sending signal reports or asking for uh, verification of her signal reports. <laughs> um, they let it go at that, but... Uh, I had to go have a little talk with my wife when I got home. <laughs> oh, boy, you have to be careful. Arnold, what do you got up your sleeve? Oh, it's Dave. Hey, Tom. Hey, Dave, uh, hi. I remember Phil Weingarten. We'd, we'd go down the stairs, Arnold and I, and we're looking for a plate transformer. <laughs> and uh, I had short hair, and Arnold had long hair. <laughs> So I found this plate transformer and I said, uh, hey, how much is this plate transformer? And he looked at me and he goes, for you, $20. And then he points to Arnold and he says, for you, $40. <laughs> That's a great, a great wine garden story. I have another story that uh, related to spies. I didn't fit it into the talk, but... Uh, my grandmother lived on 84th Street in New York City, a typical little old lady, probably uh, well into her 80s. 
And uh, she was always looking around for German spies, as everybody was in New York <laughs> City. And she saw this guy going out of a building next door, and she, she watched him, and she watched him, and she watched him. And finally, she called up the FBI. <laughs> and, you know, the FBI must get 500 calls a day from little old ladies thinking that they, they've seen a German spy. Well, the, she kept after them, and finally, they sent out an FBI agent and he went over and he checked out the building and checked out the guy. And by God, he was a German agent. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, what do you got up your sleeve? You got to unmute yourself. Jim, Jim, turn on your microphone, Jim. Jim, hold on. I'll do it for you. So I got it. I got it. I got it. Can you okay, hear me now? On. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Thanks a bunch for the presentation. It was great. You're welcome. It brought back some memories of me with the Bureau. Uh, first with Norton, the bomb site, I thought it was still classified because I worked for Norton when they developed the uh, inertial guidance system for the suborbital flight by, uh, by Alan Shepard. And also, as you were talking, I was making notes. Somewhere on my bench, I think I have a fountain pen with a microphone built inside. Really? Yes. Wow. <laughs> I have some other items and things, too. I they also agree. remember some clandestine operations in New Jersey with CW or they would beam the, the signal from Russia to a double spy in New Jersey. They wow. would beam the signal towards the south, southern part of the U.S., like near Florida. And if he acted upon it, they knew it was compromised. So there was no action, because we had operators down in Florida. But when they beamed the antenna towards New Jersey, and he acted upon it, then there was a valid message. My job was to copy the message when it came out, somewhere around midnight on, on the weekend. Wow. And they were called trinomes. There's dynomes, two numbers, trinomes are three numbers. And that, that gave them the location where to look for a, a hollowed out twig somewhere in a park in New Jersey. Wow. Uh, I asked for permission to make some of these comments, but the, I haven't received an answer yet. Yeah. They also used telephone poles where you see those big transformers from the power company. They would hollow out the transformer and put a camera in there. Wow. The camera would operate many times via solar power so they could move the camera around to follow the subject. That That's was great. Item. That's great. There's Bring some that. others. I didn't, know, I didn't know where to, I couldn't make the notes fast enough, really. I all know what Jim did, right? <laughs> Bring that pen to the next meeting, will you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I, was assigned, I was assigned for two years. I was in the Navy and expected to be aboard ship. They sent me to the desert between Turkey and Russia, somewhere around Afghanistan. Two years in the desert, uh, listening to signals emanating from somewhere around the Black Sea. Uh, that's as far as I could go with that part. Because Jim knows CW in Cyrillic. Yes. Oh, yeah, we wow. used uh, Russian-made typewriters for our work. And wow. uh, I wish I could say more. I'm waiting to get Clarence to say some more about it. But we'll see what happens in the next visit. Thanks that's so great. Much. I'll, I'll, I'll to have to give a... I'll give a talk on the Russian code machines too. Fred, you've been very patient. Fred, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Judith asked me to ask you, were you going to give a talk at Fairlawn on Enigma? Um, I have not been asked to give a talk on Enigmas yet. Um, I gave one at the uh, New York, former New York club. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to give one. Um, I, I offered to give one for the New Jersey Antique Radio Club at some point. We'll discuss it with them. Okay. The other thing is I was dragged down with my by my brother down to Radio Row. And believe it or not, he was blind. We took the bus over and he says, all this neat stuff over here. And, he, you know, he knew the guys down there and I'd never been down there. But we spent a whole afternoon on a nice, sunny, warm day just looking at stuff. But we couldn't drag anything back because we had to take the bus back. So <laughs> that was my experience. That was a, that was a pain because some of those sets were really really big and heavy. Luckily, I lived right in Manhattan, so my, I could get my father to drive the car down and fill it up with this junk. And <laughs> he was very patient. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. It was very good. I'll be Thanks. back in a minute. I just have to check something inside. Thanks, Fred. Any other comments or thoughts? Mr. Gibbons. Yeah, go ahead, John. A couple of, couple of things. I, uh, first of all, I got to put a quick comment to Noah and his very clandestine uh, uh, background there, you know, very dark. Um, 
but back the question <laughs> the question to you is I saw you you obviously were showing a couple of pictures of some uh, some uh, suspicious character that also is the presenter um, did you uh, do you ha are you the owner of that equipment were you just uh, uh, you know using someone someone else's equipment when um, or is that part of your collection um, I, I move this equipment around, so the uh, B2 spy radio that that really, really sleazy looking guy uh, had actually, this is, might be interesting to you, you can actually see it in the spy museum in New York City. I sold it to the spy museum along with an Enigma and a Fialca and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, the other stuff, the uh, that uh, radio with the different size uh, antennas I just sold um, in New Hampshire at an auction to a museum. So um, I, I do like to uh, play with these things for a while and then sell them. That even goes for uh, Enigma machines. Uh, selling one or two of those a year makes my day. <laughs> I have a question, John. <laughs> it's really great. It's really great. So what happened to the guy with no clothes on? What what do you think the Gestapo had in, play, in up their sleeve for him for being so brazen <laughs> is to run around in his socks and shoes? I, I, I don't even want to think, you know, where, the, where that whole thing would go. And Jim, if you ever bring that pen to a meet, I'm never talking to you again. Do you understand me? <laughs> <laughs> Make sure the battery's still turned off. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's all I need. Yeah. Any other feedback for our presenter this evening? It was a I'm great show. Wondering whether, wondering whether anybody would catch on to my sort of stealth mode over here. Yes. I thought well, we see uh, bobbing and weaving over there. Very to attend this thing. The, uh, yeah, my, my experience, I'm, I'm a little younger. So my first uh, job out of college in the 70s was with a company, uh, GTE Sylvania, and it was the communication systems division. So I was working on the... Uh, encrypted telephones, uh, the KY3 and, you know, the red phones and the black phones and passing encryption keys and all that kind of stuff is one of my first jobs. And then I, I also, in that same stint that I did there at the company, worked on the uh, buried antennas that were ex the ELF, the extremely low frequency communication systems that went through the Earth's crust to communicate to the, uh, to the submarines that were dragging the very long antennas behind them. So it was fascinating to, uh, you know, hear more about the spy world and, and the Cold War and World War II. It kind of, you know, brought back some memories of the, the first things that I worked on when I got out of college. What, what frequency did they use for the, those sub uh, communications, John? I've often wondered. Well, if I told you, I might have to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> it, put it, it wasn't so much the frequency. I mean, it was it was roughly around, a, it had sort of like a center carrier frequency of like 72 hertz. And so, you know, a one would be like at 80 hertz and a zero would be down around 64 hertz. Uh -huh. But the interesting part was, Part of my job was the, they were basically gigantic audio amplifiers that were the size of gymnasiums. They were putting hundreds and hundreds of amperes into these huge buried cables up in the Michigan Northern Peninsula and up in Wisconsin into the granite crust. And because of the carrier frequency, the, uh, the bit rate or frame rate had to be so low that it was if it wasn't balanced properly between the ones and the zeros the you could stand on a street corner in a city in Michigan or Wisconsin and you could watch the lights dim the street lights dim and you could figure out the messages if you knew what you were doing you know by the, so my job was to essentially balance these humongous amplifiers so that the the grid wouldn't get pulled down so that the street lights wouldn't dim when they were communicating Very to the submarines. What, what kind of amplifier uh, output uh, did you use? Tubes? I guess you had to. Yeah, yeah. And they were monstrous with humongous transformers into these really long lengths of cable. Mm. And I had to develop a, uh, what, what would happen was if, while these cables were being buried, if, if anything happened, 
to the insulation on these very long cables, very quickly you would get essentially a crater. <laughs> it, it, the things would explode and just move a lot of dirt out of the way. So my my very clever college kid uh, approach to this was to basically take an AM transistor radio and capacitively couple it to these big long cables because when the arcing would just barely begin to start, if there was insulation breakdown, of course that was static on the AM, so it was a simple AM detector that would throw the switch to kill the power before the little bit of arcing turned into a giant hole in the ground. But wow. uh, my boss that, at that time thought that was pretty clever for a college kid to use a <laughs> you know, this multi-million dollar installation putting hundreds of amps of current into the Earth's crust and I'm using an AM radio to <laughs> turn it on and off when necessary. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And did you ever come across um, Hitler's uh, Goliath transmitter? Hitler had a, uh, uh, the most powerful radio transmitter ever built. Uh, built uh, in northern France to communicate with his submarines, and the antennas oh, no. were antennas were one mile apart, and uh, the the transmitter was called a Goliath, and it had uh, it ran a, a megawatt into the antennas, which then of course increased the gain by a great deal. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the frequency that that they were using was in the Hundred kilohertz range, rather than okay. Yeah, no, we were we were, yeah, we were yeah we were below we were below a hundred hertz. And, yeah, uh, and that makes and, a lot of sense because that's that's definitely the way to get into water and ground. Right, right. Yeah. I had to. Funny thing was, we had you know whenever I wanted, I had to write a silly little program on one of those. It was it was a Texas Instruments. I don't want to call it a computer because it really wasn't a computer, but it was even, you know, it was before the trash 80 and it was before the, all that stuff. It was almost more like a programmable calculator where I was calculating the various inductances and capacitances to essentially make matching networks to go into the antennas into the ground. Yeah. But every time we wanted to try a new one of my ideas, we had to, there was like a giant erector set, almost like a, a you know, a, a monkey bars set on steroids with all these links to these huge oil filled capacitors, which every time we wanted to try a new experiment, we had to go in and discharge them with this long pole with uh, giant straps of metal on the end and would throw quite an arc. And so I had a lot of fun discharging the caps in between my experiments as to changing capacitor <laughs> values. And we, I mean, using craftsman tools, you know, craftsman ratchet sets, because everything was like three quarter and seven eighths inch nuts on big bolts to couple all these things together because of the currents in, involved. And it was, it was a pretty bizarre, you know, thing to do for your first job out of college, you know, not something that I would have ever guessed I would have been doing. Did anyone ever write it up, uh, John? Uh, it sounds like something that really should be in the history of uh, radio electronics, etc. Well, I mean, at, at the time I had a secret clearance in order to be working on it, so I don't know how much. I mean, by now, it's, there's probably stuff in the public domain. If you, I never tried to Google the, you know, the the Elf system and the the submarine communication system, but yeah, you know, at the time it was all very hush hush and uh, it, it's Lena. funny the, the way the government does things this one last little story about it because it was way up but the first trip I ever made up there was of course in the dead of winter and so we were wait, you know it was <laughs> it was below zero and just the way the government does things I, and with the lights dimming out in the neighborhoods and all that and, you know there were there were people worried about what the government was doing up there with this military <laughs> installation. And so as part of like the environmental impact statement, they wanted to know what was happening to the animals and things, you know, when, yeah. when we were doing all these things. So mm -hmm. they, they shipped up, I think out of maybe your own stomping grounds down in Manhattan somewhere or somewhere in New York city, they shipped up a, a shipment of a couple of dozen pigeons <laughs> that they were going to let, you know, sit in the trees or walk around on the ground while, you know, near all these antennas and everything. And 
you know, it w within a matter of hours, they were all dead because they froze to death because it was like <laughs> it's 18 degrees below zero. And we could literally like pick up these rock solid pigeons and like, you know, <laughs> slide them down the street because they were, <laughs> it was just the stupidest thing. It's like, no, the antennas didn't kill them. It was the fact that it's 20 below zero up here in Wisconsin. <laughs> and then you let these poor pigeons loose and they, they died, you know, within practically minutes. It was ridiculous. The, there was the, the penguin shipment didn't make it. I, I right, it. right. No, they didn't send us penguins. They sent us like warm-blooded mm -hmm. pigeons or something. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Bill, you've been very patient. Go ahead. Yeah, I, am. <clears throat> I understand now that uh, those data rates and those VLF signals were so slow that they have a, a couple of short signals to alert, alert a particular submarine that they've got a high priority message and uh, they get up to within like periscope distance of the surface and then they pop up a cable connected satellite transceiver and uh, check in that way and get their detailed long detailed message and they can send a short acknowledgement without really jeopardizing their position because it's aimed straight up. It's very hard to do a direction finding on those things so that's what i understand they do now and that data transmission on the vfl uh, vlf signals <laughs> one two words a minute maybe and no way that the submarine could reply to it in the on that frequency yeah they they basically what i was told was they already had their targets well identified and basically we were only sending a message that said fire or don't fire but they, <laughs> they already knew what they were going to be firing at you know very interesting jim had something to throw in i think before we wrap things up here yeah thanks uh, just a, a quick note about the uh, the submarines i do recall that the russians used the upper end of the audio frequency to transmit to the submarines into the Black Sea and over into the Mediterranean. Uh, very high power, but low, low frequency, uh, just above the audible range. Unbelievable, unbelievable at that time. Thanks. That's it. Yeah. Well, we're getting uh, close to our 8.30 hour here. It's been another uh, sensational summer evening way to spend some time and learn and uh, get to see each other. So, uh, Appreciate you all coming in. All this for a $6 internet membership, I'll tell you. <laughs> if they had any idea what they were missing. So tell your friends, but uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Any parting comments, questions, reactions before we wrap things up this evening? Thanks, John. Hard. Thank you. Thank Hard. you very much, John. Just a thanks, thanks to everybody who, you know, right. who participates and everybody who sets this all up i mean this is just this has been great this has been such a bonus over and above you know what was already great feeling as a member of this club and just who knew that something this great would come out of this ridiculous situation that we were pushed into with this whole covid thing but this unintended this really consequences right yeah. yep. very good thank you for everything for the okay thank, thank you all it's take care gentlemen hey dave see you, on the, net. See you on the net tomorrow morning yeah, Take you care. Bet. Guys. Dave, Have a good night. Dave, see if you Stay can get off. Arnold to come on these things. Is it a possibility? Uh, yeah, I don't know if he has a camera, though. It uh, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think he may have come to one of these. I'm sorry I misidentified you. 